Hi, this video documents some of my experiences with the new FPC 1500, which is advertised as a spectrum analyzer, but manages to perform multiple functions. It ended up being useful for a wide range of radio and non-radio related tasks. The FPC 1500 is therefore an instrument that nearly any engineer can make significant use of. This video only covers a few topics, but there is a lot more information written up. So please do read the written report as well for more photos, diagrams and comments and so on. The first topic to cover is usability. During my time using it, although it was a very new product, I found no bugs that I could not work around. The bugs were very slight and have been reported so that the next firmware update should be even better. The unit is light, compact and totally silent because there is no fan. And more than any other instrument, RF tools in general need to be powered up for hours on end while tweaking designs. So I was impressed that I no longer have to get sad about switching on such a tool and having to live with noise right next to me. For me, this is a huge productivity boost alone. At the back, there is not much a trigger or external reference input and LAN and USB connections and of course the power entry and also on off switch. The buttons are laid out conventionally, but a good feature was that the units buttons, such as for frequency and DBM, are right alongside the number keypad area. So I don't need to divert attention between the buttons and reading the screen to find the soft keys for all the main settings when operating it. I can set the frequency, span, amplitude and bandwidth uh, all by using the hard keys really rapidly. The screen is really large and clear provided it is viewed face on. There is some dimness and colour changing when viewed from above and that's very noticeable if you're sitting very close to the instrument. At a few feet distance the angle of view is shallow and then all is good. There is also 2.4 GHz wireless LAN capability with this device as well. The connectivity options are good and I can see why because the PC software called Instrument View is excellent and you will want to use it whether it's via wireless, LAN or USB. The way it works is that the left hand side has a menu and every feature of it that I tried was well executed. You can click on Report Generator to create fancy multiple page reports that could be supplied to a customer or filed away in a lab book. The Get Trace feature is extremely good. It captures deep information that can be annotated with markers and overlaid with subsequent traces, but it also captures all the information that typically one would forget to write down if just a screen capture had been obtained, such as whether any parameters were manually set, what averaging and detector was applied and so on. The data set that is captured could be given to anyone else also running instrument view so, they can, so that they can see all this detailed information too. Next up is a screenshot feature which does what it says and I used it a lot for precisely capturing the screen as it is so that others can see what I actually saw on the actual display on the FPC 1500. The instrument has a file system and relies on particular formatted files for all sorts of configuration. The instrument view software provides a nice graphical interface for creating those data files for various purposes. Everything was intuitive for all the things I tried here and I didn't need to resort to reading a user manual. The configuration files are in a good hierarchy in the instrument and the software provides the ability to transfer files back and forth between the instrument and the PC in a very easy manner. It's very smooth and there is no need to use a USB memory stick to transfer files. Everything can be done over the network. You can also set up multiple measurement tasks to provide a wizard that will prompt to take each measurement. This is handy if you know many steps are needed to be repeated for different boards or antennas for example. The instrument view software was so good that I think it is an important part of the usability of the FPC 1500. Next I explored the performance of the spectrum analyzer, starting with the noise floor. Each of the horizontal blue bands show where the noise floor is and the guaranteed limit value and the typical value, so that the top part of the blue band is a guaranteed limit and the bottom part is a typical value. There are two stripes of blue, one is without the preamplifier and the other one is with the preamplifier. You can see from 10 MHz and beyond, the noise floor is really low. Also, the FPC 1500 has a resolution bandwidth down to 1 Hz, so this noise floor is what is seen on the screen. I then overlaid half a dozen other spectrum analyzers for comparison. The way to view this is to pick a colour and then follow the two stripes of that colour. Again, one is with and one is without the preamplifier. The key sight one in red performed better below 10 MHz. But for the large 10 MHz to 3 GHz spectrum, the FPC 1500 performed better. 
Another parameter is the range of possible input power that can be viewed. I only graphed the 100 MHz to 3 GHz range here, but the full range is available in the written report. The FPC 1500 is a clear 10 dB at the top end and a massive difference at the bottom end too, depending on which other spectrum analyzer it is compared with. This information is without the preamplifier. Although this range is huge, in practice there could be distortion that could cause more spectrum lines to appear on the display that are not really present on the input signal, but are caused by the spectrum analyzer itself. The most disturbing one is when there is distortion close to the signals of interest, and it's defined by a value called the third order intercept point. To cut a long story short, to avoid seeing such distortion on the display, you need to make sure that the input signal doesn't exceed a particular power level. This is relevant when you know that the input signal has high power at frequencies that are close because it would result in that distortion right on the display span. I graphed it out because it makes it easier to see how it is affected by resolution bandwidth. The third order intercept line is always at a fixed gradient as are the lines representing the bandwidth settings and where they intercept the maximum in input power can be read off and the maximum dynamic range too. I collected the results into this table and the blue columns are the ones of interest here. The maximum power is the power mixer value, so if, say, an attenuator is enabled, then the input power level can be increased provided the power at the first mixer inside the spectrum analyzer doesn't exceed the value in that column. The pink columns represent a different distortion, when if you've got a very pure input signal, then the noise floor will raise itself around the signal because the internal spectrum analyzer oscillator also has noise and it impresses itself onto the view of the input signal on the display. The time when you're interested in the level around the input signal is when you wish to measure the, noise, the phase noise of the input signal, but you end up seeing something misleading and you're actually seeing the spectrum analyzer oscillator noise instead. To avoid seeing that, the input signal needs to be below a certain level. We can see the shape of the noise of the internal spectrum analyzer oscillator by feeding in a good quality signal, and this is discussed in more detail in the write-up. Next I examined some of the traditional radio related topics. I won't dwell on this for long, suffice to say that the device supports the majority of uh, the important analogue and digital schemes such as AM, FM, ASK and FSK. For AM I used a homemade modulator and it was possible to see the carrier and sidebands and then make the tweaks to the circuit to achieve 100% modulation or close enough since this was an analogue circuit. Nowadays it would be done digitally. Also, it's possible to invoke modulation apps inside the FPC 1500 to do deeper analysis uh, with useful information such as Cyanide, which represents if the signal is likely to be intelligible to the end listener of the AM signal. 10 dB Cyanide is about the threshold of intelligibility usually, so you want to be higher than that. I loaded up a configuration file that I'd created earlier with the Instrument View software and used it to get an immediate pass fail report for the parameters I'd configured. For FM, the spectrogram view was great for seeing the lobes generated at different tones applied to an FM transmitter. This is the sort of thing that is difficult to visualise without seeing it for real with, a, with such a spectrum analyzer. A great use case for spectrum analyzers is to examine a circuit for EMI or electromagnetic inf interference, or just to see what is going on in a circuit using a non-intrusive method. A couple of ways are to use magnetic and electric field probes, also known as H-field and E-field probes. You can buy these or make them. My ones are works in progress and I'm still developing them. The FPC 1500 is sensitive enough to work very well even with small probes. I applied the probe to areas close to the inductors on the Pi 3 Model B. It was interesting to see the change in activity as the CPU load was increased. When all four cores were busy, naturally the activity increased. Ordinarily, you might not know the precise frequency span of interest, so it's good that the FPC 1500 is quite speedy, even with large spans, and yet also has a great noise floor too. It makes it really good for such probing activity quickly around a PCB with a small probe. I also tried the homemade E-field probe. Here I was able to trace a signal from a clock oscillator by moving it around over the PCB traces.
Another nice feature is a built-in signal generation capability. It can be used independently or tied to the spectrum sweep. As an example, I used it to examine the response of a homemade amplifier and it worked as expected. This is a normal use of a tracking generator and even without it, there are workarounds such as using an external signal generator. However, where the capability comes into its own is combined with the vector network analyzer or VNA capability that will be described very shortly. But first I decided to try out the measurement of phase noise of an externally applied oscillator, which in my case was from an analog device's direct digital synthesis chip. These are really high performance and therefore if you recall the discussion earlier about phase noise, then you'll know there is no way that it could be measured directly uh, with any low cost spectrum analyzer due to the values shown in the dynamic range chart earlier. However, armed with the tracking generator capability and a few other nice features of the FPC 1500, then this is feasible. To do this, one method is to change the goalpost slightly so that the aim becomes to measure the phase noise at a frequency which matches a crystal filter. These are often available at 10.7 MHz pass band, so I use that. With the tracking generator, it's possible to see the filter response and see the difference between the pass band area and the filtered area. This is a huge difference with the 8 pole filter that I used, more than 80 dB, which means a power ratio of 1 times 10 to the 8. Now the tracking generator can be switched off and the DDS output was connected to the filter instead. I set the frequency to sit outside of the filter passband and then I would measure the phase noise inside the passband. The reason for doing this is so that the DDS frequency will only appear as a small peak that is well within the spectrum analyzer dynamic range, meaning that there is no risk of the spectrum analyzer's own oscillator noise being visible on the screen. With a very low noise floor and possibly the preamplifier enabled too, it should be possible to observe the phase noise of the DDS output within the passband because that will not be attenuated greatly at all. And this is precisely what I saw. The peak is outside of the passband and so the level is low. To the right of it, I could see the phase noise of the DDS. The unevenness is due to the filter response. To make the phase noise measurement, one final feature of the FPC 1500 is needed, and that is to set the marker to noise mode where it automatically makes all the correct calculations and displays the phase noise. This value is relative to the carrier it sees because it has no idea that there's a filter attached. So all that needs to be done is now to add the filter passband difference and all is complete. This is a difficult measurement to achieve without a very high end spectrum analyzer. But in this slightly limited scenario, the filter approach is a good option on, if you're on a severe budget. We're now into VNA territory for the remainder of the review. Antenna matching is possibly the most desirable use case for development engineers because it is needed a lot, uh, simply because so many devices have wireless capability of some sort. The FPC 1500 would suit sub 1 GHz, Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz wireless LAN and many other antenna matching needs. Using a VNA requires some good quality cables and connectors and a calibration method too. I used a mechanical calibrator, but to save headache, there is a ZN Z103, which is an electronic calibration tool. One end of it has a USB connection to the FPC 1500, so that it can be controlled by it during the one-touch calibration procedure. I don't own it, but unless you're familiar with using a VNA, the mechanical calibrator method needs a lot of care, and it is very easy to make a mistake, which can have a big difference in the measured result. I believe most engineers will not have encountered a VNA, so there is a learning curve. The ZN Z103 costs under $1,000, which frankly is a good price. I'd expected it to be higher. And basically it must be budgeted if you want to make reasonable use of the VNA and have no existing calibration set. The reason for the calibration is that the VNA works by measuring the phase of reflections from whatever it is connected to. It is known as a S11 or one port measurement, and it is extremely useful. By seeing the amplitude and phase of the reflected signal, it is possible to determine whether the attached component or circuit, also known as a network, looks like it, a good pure 50 ohm load, or if there's any imaginary component to the impedance, in other words, any reactance, i.e. inductance or capacitance in the circuit too. And the slightest difference in phase or delay will result in a different measurement. Therefore, the calibration procedure is used to apply known values at a point of measurement, which will take into account all the delays and impedance up to the point where the calibration is done, which is also known as the calibration plane. That's where the mechanical calibrator or the electronic calibration tool is applied. Once this is done, the VNA is ready for measurements. If you're using a mechanical calibrator, then the known values are nearly always an open circuit, a short circuit and a 50 ohm load, and so it can be known as an OSL calibration, short for open, short and load. 
Hopefully it will be supplied with coefficients that describe the length of the calibrator and its impedance and capacitance too, because no open or short circuit can be 100% free of capacitance or inductance. These parameters are typed into instrument view and then uploaded into the FBC 1500. With the electronic calibration, this is not needed. For these tests, unfortunately, I do not have the coefficients, so I had to guess them as best as possible and iterate until I had something just about usable. It's non-ideal and inaccurate, and I will need to purchase a calibration tool. After calibration, you can hook up an antenna, taking a lot of care not to move any cables or loosening any connectors by mistake. On the FPC 1500, the Smith chart view is ideal for the antenna matching procedure. This is what it looks like. The chart is designed to allow you to see what series or parallel components to attach to the load, in this case the antenna, in order to match it to a source impedance of 50 ohms or any arbitrary source. To do that, you can traverse the paths shown in grey, and the distance traversed represents a resistance or reactance. For more detail, the best explanation I've found is in Chris Bowick's book, which is an easy read and it's not maths heavy at all. It's basically a classic introduction to RF. Also, RF Office by Wave Dimension is quite good low-cost software, and the developers are responsive to solving problems. I found an issue and it was fixed within a week. Another great use for a VNA is to characterise electronic components. One example is to determine the Q of an inductor. For this test, I wanted to know the Q value for a wireless charging coil. Since wireless charging coils don't come with an end connector, I needed some trick to attach the coil at the ca calibration plane. The procedure I used was to remove the end connector adapter that was used for the calibration plane and then replace it with something that was close to the same electrical length. That something was a short stub of coax attached to an SMA connector. By trimming the coax by a millimetre at a time, it was possible to approximately get the length very similar so that the phase of the reflected signal would almost match what I was getting with the original end connector calibration. This short coax effectively becomes a test fixture for attaching the component of interest. I soldered the wireless charging coil to the coax and then the procedure I used was to also solder a very high Q capacitor across it and then examine the Smith chart on the FBC 1500 for the impedance to be totally real with no imaginary component. At that point on the Smith chart, the resistance was read off and applied to the formula shown here. A marker was placed as close as possible to the fully real impedance. The value moves a bit because the VNA isn't intended for such large values as shown here, but if you can arrange your test so that the result is less than around 5 to 10k ohms, then it is a very handy tool in the absence of owning a dedicated impedance meter. Another great feature of the FBC 1500 is the inbuilt application that makes use of the VNA to perform cable measurements. There are a couple of features actually, but the one I tested showed any faults or anomalies over the length of a cable. It works even when there is only one end of the cable that can be connected to the device. For this test, I attached a very high quality LMR 400 cable. The way it works is that it sends various frequencies into the cable and examines the amplitude and phase of the reflection. In the time domain view, the phase corresponds to delay, which of course is related to length. This means that it's possible to have an x-axis marked in meters so that you can see at what point on the cable anomalies are present. There are dozens of cable models preloaded into the FPC 1500 and more can be created using the instrument view software. The LMR 400 model is already available and it specifies things like the dielectric constant and velocity factor. The result shown here shows in faint yellow that at 4 meters the cable was unterminated and the standing wave ratio was off the chart. With the correct 50 ohm termination, you can see in bright yellow that the SWR reached around 1.1 at that termination and almost exactly 1.0 all the way up to it, which is very good. This sort of test reveals even the slightest anomalies in cables and joins and adapters and terminations. Incidentally, I also tried this feature with unshielded twisted pair cable too, and there is some, some more information in the full report. So to summarize, I felt that this instrument is really suited for very diverse use cases. The VNA opens up a lot of opportunities for cable and component testing characterization, as well as the very important task of antenna matching. This instrument never felt like a cut down device. The performance and features mix is excellent and any engineer is going to get a lot of work done with this on the workbench. And unlike other test instruments, because it is more affordable than a typical VNA and spectrum analyzer, and because it is silent and takes up little space, it is more likely to be actually powered up and used more often, making it really good value. If I could change just one thing, it would be better viewing angles on the display. This is a classy instrument otherwise, it has very stable software, nice construction and really great features. I feel this is like a Swiss army knife of a product, 
but it isn't trying to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, because the performance is actually really good, sufficient to do a lot of valuable work. I'm surprised it's called a spectrum analyzer, though it does it injustice. I hope this review is useful. For comments and discussion, please see the full written report.